piece that we're talking today in a session, Mechanisms for Health Systems Management, Reflections on World Bank and USAID Experiences. Um, we have two very distinguished uh, guests to kick off our discussions. We're going to start with Dr. Benjamin Levinson, who has been a lead public health specialist at the World Bank since 1999. As you can see in the bios that we handed out, has been active particularly in South Asia, also at the Asia Development <coughs> Bank, Philippine Department of Health, and UNICEF. Uh, he's going to be sharing some of his insights from Afghanistan in particular, and um, obviously a country of critical interest to the United States and uh, in critical need for the services that we'll be talking about. Um, we're also pleased to bring the perspective of an uh, international financial institution into the discussion. We've had a lot of um, uh, discussion from an NGO perspective, service delivery perspective, um, from, from aid and some of the bilaterals, but so it's terrific that we have um, the IFI's perspective as well. And then uh, Sally Craig Huber, who, who many of you know, is Deputy Director for Performance Management in the Center for Country Programs at Management Sciences for Health. Uh, Sally, as you can see from the bio, has been active in many, many countries and has um, the ability to draw on um, a lot of experience in different contexts, many of which uh, are fair to say are, are fairly unstable places. Uh, and so <coughs> we look forward to her lessons learned um, in, in these different settings <coughs> as well. Uh, uh, just a couple final notes before we turn the floor over to Benjamin. One is that, um, as uh, some of you know, I think we try to capture both the, the sessions on video uh, and, and broadcast it to um, in a password-protected website for the aid family, so to speak, um, and then also <laughs> captured in meeting summaries and the PowerPoint slides and associated documents. Uh, we have out on the table the information for accessing all that information with the past summaries. We've also gone the extra step and, and um, have some of the, the summaries of the meetings without all the kind of discussion on the public side as well. So you can share that with a broader set of, of colleagues. And then just a final note to say that part, as a spin-off from this work, we've tried to um, really engage some of the academics on the research that broadly under <coughs> a category of population or demography and security. And we have a, a listserv that in many ways is trying to keep up to date with some of the, the research on that side that you're all most welcome to join. And the instructions for that, uh, doing that are also on our website, but you can ask uh, any of my colleagues about how to do that and we'll, we'll get you that information. We uh, urge you to, to join that as well. So please, Benjamin, can we turn the floor over to you? Thank you. Um, okay, great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, it's, it's actually quite a pleasure to, to be here. Um, and um, so I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about working with NGOs in post-conflict settings. Uh, some of the experience that, that uh, my colleagues and I working in the World Bank have had in, in Afghanistan uh, and perhaps their implications uh, for working elsewhere in, in post-conflict situations. Um, what I'd like to talk about uh, this afternoon is a little bit on, on the background of Afghanistan, uh, some of the experience that Afghanistan has had with working uh, with NGOs, and uh, lastly summarize what I think are the lessons learned and, and, and perhaps are some of their, their implications, both for, for USAID and uh, others of us who are working uh, in post-conflict settings. Um, first thing to notice is, is that uh, Afghanistan was always poor. Uh, this is not this is not new. Uh, it was always behind its South Asian neighbors in terms of uh, access to health services and and health status. So you can see here that in 1960 it had a U5MR that was estimated at 350, whereas the rest of South Asia had about uh, a U5MR of of 250. Uh, and uh, you know, in 1990, look at what happened to South Asia. Uh, Afghanistan was still uh, it was still pretty high, so uh, this was this was always a poor country. It's it was uh, uh, always facing significant challenges. Um, this is some work done by Linda Bartlett and our colleagues from CDC and and in the Ministry of Public Health in Afghanistan. Uh, this was uh, the results of a study on uh, measuring maternal mortality ratios in in different parts of of Afghanistan, and you can see that as you get more rural and more uh, isolated. The uh, MMR goes up and it gets quite dramatically high. So this is 
uh, a part of Badakhshan province in the far northeast uh, of the country, and they recorded a <coughs> maternal mortality ratio of 6,500 per 100,000 live births, which is some sort of record um, globally. I don't think anybody's ever found an MMR that high. In fact, it made people suspicious about sort of, you know, the methodology that was used. But I think that even if you look at the uh, more accessible areas, I mean, it's certainly consistent and, and, and very, very high. So uh, in 2002, after the Taliban had fallen, there was uh, a couple of joint donor missions that compromised, uh, comprised uh, people from USAID and WHO and the World Bank and DFID and a number of other partners. Uh, the first one was in, in March of, of that year, and um, I have to say at the, at the time there was lots to worry about. Uh, you had an extremely poor country uh, with uh, very modest physical infrastructure, uh, in the, both in the health sector and, and more broadly. And you had, uh, what health workers you had were afflicted what I called the three wrongs. Uh, they were the wrong gender, meaning they were mostly male in a place which where females just are not going to be uh, attended by, by male health workers. Uh, they tended to have the wrong skills. They, what, what, what skills they had tended to be sort of hospital and clinic based. They had really very little understanding of primary health care. Uh, and they were definitely in the wrong location. So you had a preponderance of, of health workers in the urban areas, particularly Kabul, uh, and not nearly enough health workers in the, in the rural parts of, of Afghanistan. Um, and uh, it's so bad, it's still pretty bad. 42% uh, <coughs> of the health force of the Ministry of Public Health work in Kabul where 15% of the population live. So, I mean, there's a complete mismatch between where the people are and where the health workers are, has, has been up until now. Um, and then you had a lot of, of NGO activity. Uh, you had about 65 NGOs that were active in the health sector, uh, but very limited coordination of those activities. And this is just sort of a schematic of, of what I'm trying to get at, but I actually have maps that show uh, what this uh, schematic really uh, tries to get at, which is, you have a lot of NGOs, and they tended to have clinics around roads where access was relatively easy, and a lot of areas which were unserved and uncovered. I once found uh, two NGO clinics, uh, one run by different NGOs that were 500 meters apart. Uh, and then you had large swaths of the country where there's really nothing. So uh, you had uh, a, a real situation of, of over over uh, uh, commitment of resources in some areas, duplication of services, and then huge gaps in services in other parts of the country. Now, the, the result of all this chaos was uh, lack of clinics in underserved areas. It was very difficult to hold anybody accountable for a specific geographical area. There was no concept of a catchment area. And as a result of that, uh, people focused on the clinics rather than the community. Uh, you didn't have much concern about immunization coverage, etc. Uh, all you had was, you know, everybody f figuring out how to get the most patients into their particular clinic. Um, and uh, so then the question is, well, was there a health si system really to reconstruct? Uh, uh, my view on this is, is probably not. If you look at the results from the 2003 mix, this was a household survey that was financed by UNICEF and done in collaboration with the Central Statistics Office, uh, you can see that in rural Afghanistan, CPR was less than about 5%. Antenatal care was actually even lower than that. Um, you know, to me, that means you don't have much, much in the way of health services. Uh, DPT-3 coverage was 19.5% uh, uh, in rural areas of, of Afghanistan. It's way below, there's huge rural-urban difference in, in Afghanistan and it's way, way behind the rest of South Asia in, 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 these, in these services. I guess I just editorialize a little bit. I mean, I think Afghanistan has always been two countries. There's an urbane and urban country, which is actually quite sophisticated and, and very worldly in many ways, and a rural part of the country which essentially lives in the Middle Ages uh, and has not had access to, to much in the way of, of service delivery. And I guess that's what these uh, statistics really get at. There were, however, reasons for optimism. First, you had a, a pretty determined people. Um, 
and you had very talented leadership in, in uh, the Ministry of Health uh, at the time. Gary and I had the good fortune, Gary Cook and I had the good fortune of, of uh, chatting with, with uh, the Minister and Deputy Minister of Health at the time. The Deputy Minister in particular was somebody of rare talent and I don't think I've had as skillful a counterpart to work with in a long time. So you had, you had uh, strong leadership. Uh, you also had a lot of donor assistance. Money was flowing into Afghanistan. There were a lot of people who were interested in supporting uh, the country. Uh, you had a vibrant international, uh, both national and international uh, NGO community. Uh, that was estimated to provide about 80% of, of the primary health care. So what was being delivered was mostly being delivered by NGOs. Uh, and they were able to pretty quickly organize uh, mass campaigns with UNICEF support in particular and immunize 10 million children against measles, uh, probably saving you know, thousands, tens of thousands of kids' lives uh, through that, that simple, simple technique. Okay, so what's been the, uh, what was the experience of working with the NGOs? Uh, there are a number of different approaches that the major, the three major donors in, the, in, the, in Afghanistan used. Uh, the three big ones in terms of f uh, financing primary health care was really uh, the World Bank, USAID, and the European Commission. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about each one and what I see as sort of the, both the similarities and the, and the differences. Um, the Ministry of Health fairly early on recognized that there was an advantage to contracting with NGOs. Uh, and one, one of the big things that, that they saw as an advantage was uh, they wanted to have at least some stewardship and control over what the NGOs did. They wanted to avoid the chaos that they saw before where people did what they wanted to do, uh, worked where they wanted to work, and where you had very large gaps in, in coverage. Um, they uh, signed what became known as PPAs, or performance-based partnership agreements with NGOs. And these were essentially contracts. Uh, initially, uh, they covered eight uh, whole provinces uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, they had clear objectives, and there were like 10 indicators that uh, these PPAs used to evaluate the performance of the NGOs. And then there was performance bonuses that if the NGO collected them, could uh, value up to 10% of the contract, contract amount. So there was uh, uh, this idea that getting people to focus on uh, these, these 10 indicators. Um, the uh, NGOs were competitively selected. Uh, they used something in the bank, it's called QCBS, Quality and Cost-Based Selection. So they put out tenders uh, for uh, sp specific geographical areas and asked both local and international NGOs to actually put in both technical and financial proposals for uh, these geographical areas, these eight, eight provinces. And they completed this process in seven months, which is actually quite good. I, I think they, they did a, a credible job under the circumstances. Uh, by comparison, doing something similar to this in Pakistan has taken us uh, 19 months to up to 25 months. So uh, the Afghans actually did quite well in this. Now, this was all administered uh, and managed by something called the Grants and Contracts Management U Unit, or GCMU, uh, in the ministry. And uh, the GCMU, uh, the original idea was that it was going to be a fairly small unit that would look after um, all the grants and contracts financed by the, the, the different donors. Uh, and it comprised local consultants who were con competitively selected and were paid market wages. So they were paid according to their salary history and according to what the market was for people of similar skills. And um, I actually think that this has worked out. This is, uh, I get a, a bit of a digression. It's, it's probably an important one, though. Um, they uh, were able to reverse some of the brain drain by getting people from the NGOs and the UN agencies to come back and actually work in the Ministry of Public Health. So you had good people uh, who were brought back. And I have to say, as a testimony to the people who were the deputy minister and minister at the time, they really chose people not on who their families were and their connections, but really on their abilities. And uh, still to this day, I think that you have a real meritocracy. This is, a, this is a very talented group of people. And so, I mean, when people say, oh, you know, there's no capacity in, in Afghanistan, well, there's no capacity if you're going to pay $50 a month. If you're willing to pay market wages, $1,500, $2,000 a month, oh, there's lots of capacity. So uh, this has worked out actually, I think, quite well, and it's survived a change in government, uh, a change in, in ministries. 
Um, so far, the, uh, the costs of, of administering the PPAs uh, has been relatively modest. All in, it's probably less than a million dollars uh, for uh, the administrative costs. <clears throat> in addition to uh, these PPAs, or performance-based partnership agreements, the, the World Bank also financed uh, something called the Ministry of Public Health Strengthening Mechanism. And uh, this is basically where the ministry gets roughly the same amount of money uh, to, as the NGOs get, and they worked in three provinces near Kabul, uh, Kapisa, Parwan, and, and Banchir. And they had an envelope budget. It went through the government of Afghanistan system. Uh, they did their procurement through a procurement agent that was working for the government of Afghanistan. Uh, they were able to pay salaries similar to the NGOs through something called the PRR, which have Priority Reform and Restructuring, I think is what it's called. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it was a mechanism within the government which allowed people to be uh, get uh, much more competitive salaries than the $50 a month standard. Uh, but it was on a competitive basis, and it wasn't supposed to be full-time. It was uh, meant to be as w while they were performing well. Um, and then they recruited local consultants to work with the provincial health directors and uh, somebody to work at the uh, national level as a sort of coordinator for this whole, whole mechanism. Uh, this mechanism has now spread to the rural areas of Kabul province as well. So it covers, oh, I don't know, on the order of about maybe a million people or so uh, right now. Okay, now I need to digress a little bit to talk about um, uh, how these uh, PPAs were and, and the SM, MOPHSM were, were evaluated. Um, Johns Hopkins University was uh, selected on a competitive basis by the Ministry of Public Health as to provide a sort of third party evaluation of, of uh, performance of, of NGOs. And uh, they worked extensively with stakeholders around the country, both in the NGOs and the government, among other partners. Um, to develop a health facility assessment, and it was carried out, has been carried out annually countrywide. So it covers all of Afghanistan. Uh, and then every six months in between those annual uh, countrywide assessments, they work in uh, World Bank and uh, EC finance provinces as well. So um, uh, in those provinces, it gets done twice a year. Now, they formulated what they called a balanced scorecard, which is basically just rating facilities on a scale of 0 to 100. And it looks at a lot of different areas of quality of care broadly defined. So patient satisfaction, availability of drugs, equipment, staffing, uh, the knowledge of the healthcare providers, the quality of the patient provider interaction, patient load, etc. So they actually have a quite extensive health facility survey that they go through and then they come up with a, uh, a rating system uh, that uh, uh, scores each uh, individual facility and therefore you can get a, a sense of how each province uh, or area is actually, is actually performing. Okay, so here's what happened in the <coughs> PPA provinces and in the SM provinces on this balanced scorecard. You can see that they started uh, at roughly the same rate and the PPAs have uh, seen roughly a 40% uh, increase. So they went from about 50, a little less than 50 out of, on a scale of 100 up to just below 70 on a scale of 100 in less than two years uh, in terms of, of quality of care as judged by a party without any vested interest in the outcome. Uh, the SM province is also making actually reasonable progress, uh, not quite as good as the PPAs, but still pretty credible uh, given the circumstances in which they find themselves. Um, if we look at, this is data from the, uh, the mix, sur mix survey for 2003, and this is HMIS data for the other years, you can see that it looks like antenatal care has gone up remarkably. Now the HMIS system, I have to say, makes me a little nervous. I don't know whether to trust it or not. Uh, there is a household survey that's actually in the field currently. So we'll have uh, in the next four or five months actual household survey data from Afghanistan to verify whether this data is, is true or not. But um, uh, I mean, what the HMIS shows is whatever's going on, something, something big is happening. There's definitely a, a huge increase in, in the delivery of, of um, um, uh, antenatal care. Similarly, if we look at uh, TB case detection rates, uh, uh, big improvements in the PPA provinces and in the SM provinces. The SM province is a little farther behind, but still, I mean, 
given, given uh, sort of the time uh, that people are working in and the difficulties that they face, uh, I think the progress is actually quite encouraging. Um, just to, to get at what, what is the cost of insecurity in Afghanistan in terms of being able to deliver health services, um, this is the number of outpatient visits per person per year um, in two provinces, Saripul and Helmand. And the reason I chose those is uh, they're both uh, managed by uh, a local NGO called Ibn Sina. It's an Afghan NGO. It's existed for, I don't know, about uh, 10 years or so. Uh, Saripul uh, is in the north. It's a very secure area, um, uh, a beautiful province, actually. And uh, Helmand, as you may be aware, is the most dangerous area of Afghanistan. Uh, very, very difficult, very difficult security situation. Uh, about 15% of the health facilities in Helmand province have either been burned or looted by, by Taliban. So uh, uh, Helmand and, and Saripul are, are, are worlds apart. And you can see that in Saripul, they started at about 0 0.1 visits per capita per year, and now they're almost at point, uh, 1.4. So they've gone through the roof. Um, and they've b big increases even in the last six months that they've become more mobile and doing more uh, things where they're trying to get to the, the villages, etc. Now, the story in, in, in Helmand is, um, I mean, I guess this is overall is a good news, bad news, good news sort of thing. Uh, compared to Helmand, uh, compared to Saripul, uh, Helmand is doing much, much worse. Uh, they started off a little bit better, and uh, you know they they're way behind Saripul in terms of of the amount of services they provide. Um, the bad news, good news part of this is that uh, the security situation in Helmand has certainly worsened in the last year, year and a half, and in spite of that, the services continue to be delivered in in Helmand province in spite of everything. And I guess compared to where they started from. They're still roughly doing twice as many outpatient consultations as they did in 2004. So given the circumstances, uh, actually not bad. And I consider sort of Ibn Sino uh, sort of a heroic group. They've been willing to take on areas that nobody else wants to work in. Um, two of their health workers were, were assassinated, taken out of a, a, a car and just killed, you know, it's a sort of point blank. Uh, as a result, they lost about 70% of their staff. And amazingly, we're able to recruit people to replace uh, the staff that they lost. So uh, the cost of, of doing business in a, in a dangerous uh, area is, is very, very high. So if we look at sort of what I, I think is the reasons of, uh, of, of the success of, of this approach, uh, generally, uh, the number of health centers has increased about 66% in, in the PPA provinces and about 41% in the SM provinces. Uh, the percentage of facilities with trained female staff, so we started at around 25% nationwide and the PPA provinces is up to 85% already, 72% in the SM provinces. So uh, I think that in the next year or so, uh, probably 100% of facilities could have female health, trained female health workers in them, uh, partly as, as a result of, of the training of community midwives, etc. Uh, there's friendly competition. There's a, definitely a focus on results, partly a result of, of the uh, you know, constant meetings that the uh, GCMU has with uh, the NGOs, uh, et cetera. Uh, partly uh, the performance bonuses, I think, get everybody to focus on the results. Uh, the SM uh, effort is led in the Ministry of Public Health by uh, one, uh, one of the best managers I've ever met. This guy is relentless. Uh, he works 15-hour uh, days. Uh, he's a take no prisoners kind of guy. He will he will get things done. Um, I'm not sure if he's reproducible. Uh, I kind of wish he was, but um, uh, definitely he's he's definitely contributed to the success that they've had. Okay, I, Sally's going to talk a, a, a lot about uh, uh, the USAID reach effort in in Afghanistan. So let me just touch briefly on it. It was administered by MSH. It was a very large program of grants to NGOs. Um, it uh, involved, uh, at least initially, modest involvement of, of the Ministry of Public Health, although that got better and better as time went on. Uh, it started off with small grants where NGOs decided where they would work, uh, but it definitely involved towards larger grants uh, with predetermined uh, catchment areas. The EC uh, gave grants to uh, NGOs, and it was administered by the EC itself in um, 
in uh, Kabul. Also, pretty modest involvement of, of uh, the ministry in terms of administration. Uh, these were not performance-based contracts, and the NGOs supposedly contributed 10 to 20 percent of the cost. So it was sort of, it was meant as a real partnership where the NGO provided some of the financing. Um, now, uh, my friends in the EC actually became fr quite frustrated with this approach, uh, partly because they said, you know, they're really not performance-based, and what do you do if, if the NGO is not performing well? It's tough to fire somebody when they're providing some of the financing. So um, there was a bit of frustration. Uh, again, this approach uh, used uh, either whole provinces or clusters of districts. Uh, they didn't have real clear indicators, and partly because they were short-staffed, uh, there wasn't much uh, monitoring actually in the field. Let's look at what are the similarities in the approaches that were used. Uh, first of all, I think it's really important to say that all of them used the Ministry of Public Health's basic package of health services which were a series of preventive, curative, and, and promotive services, including vaccination, maternal care, family planning, tuberculosis, et cetera. So everybody focused on, on the, uh, this basic package of health services. Um, everybody also uh, used the national salary policy, which was an attempt to control wage inflation. You had, at the beginning, this sort of rush to find health workers who were qualified, um, and the fear was is that unless there was some sort of um, mechanism for uh, putting a, a cap on this, that uh, wages would be inflated beyond what was sustainable in the long run. Uh, and then the Ministry of Public Health uh, asked the bilateral donors to choose the provinces that they wanted to work in uh, to ensure uh, account well, uh, ensure coordination and, and some accountability for the results. Uh, and then they used uh, World Bank financing for those areas that uh, the, the other, mostly the USAID and EC, did not want to finance or didn't have the, the resources to finance. So um, uh, I think that USAID chose 14, 13, 13. Plus 13, 13 a little bit. <laughs> 13, 13 and a little bit. Uh, the EC uh, ended up, I think, with 10, 10 provinces, so roughly. Uh, pretty much all the provinces uh, were, were, were covered in, in, in that way. Um, so this slide basically shows the difference between 2005 and 2004 on the basic, uh, on the balanced scorecard rather, and that's the yellow bar. And you can see that the PPA is the SM. There's lots of progress, uh, the, the reach. These people uh, made a lot of progress in a short period of time, EC less so. The others is really the control group. Um, and the others actually lost, lost ground. So things actually got worse over that, that period of, of, of time. You can see that the costs are roughly similar and they're below $6 per capita per year. Um, and uh, uh, I actually think that you can do pretty good work for, I would say probably about $4 per capita per year, something I'll come back to a little bit later. That's just a little bit more on the cost per capita per year. Okay, so how have the, the different approaches evolved over time? Um, the EC is now uh, in the process of coursing its funds through the Ministry of Public Health uh, and trying to figure out ways of doing it and making the Ministry of Public Health responsible for the monitoring. They've put a number of consultants uh, into the GCMU to help strengthen it so that it can look after the EC funds. Uh, USAID is now coursing funds through an intermediary, uh, WHO, to, to the Ministry of Public Health. And as I said, I think the, the catchment areas have, have grown to um, clusters of districts. Uh, there's more, more competitive, more a contract than a grant, and they're now called performance-based partnership grant. Uh, the World Bank has been financing uh, holes in, in BPHS coverage, and so now uh, roughly 90% of the country lives in districts where there is financing for the basic package of health services. Okay, so what do I think comes out of this experience so far? I, I think there's still a lot to learn. I, I think we're not, you know, it's there, there when, when, especially when this household survey data comes out uh, in the next few months, I think there'll be even more lessons. But right now, my sense is that uh, working with NGOs on contracts can lead to large improvements in uh, health services fairly rapidly. This does not take that long. I think you can see even in two years uh, just tremendous, tremendous progress uh, in, in this area. Uh, I think that the cost of this progress is uh, pretty reasonable. If we can do it for $4 per capita per year, 
Um, okay, so Afghanistan, that's about $100 million a year for pretty much all of primary health care. I think the international community should be able to afford that. Um, I'm not sure that the Afghans can afford it right now. They should be in you know, the next few years as the economy grows and their ability to collect taxes grows. Uh, this should be affordable by the, by the government in the next, I don't know, seven to ten years. In the meantime, I'm not sure it's, it's unreasonable to ask the international community to stump up this kind of money. Uh, the monitoring and evaluation of performance is both possible in post-conflict countries and to me I think is of, of tremendous importance. Uh, I'm not sure it's easy, I'm not saying it's cheap, but it can be done and it turns out that it's really worth the trouble. You'll really find out where the problems are and, and what, needs to be, what needs to be improved. <clears throat> I think another big important uh, issue is having lots of NGOs working in an area is, is, is just not enough. And I would say that this comes both from my experience in, in Afghanistan as well as working in Cambodia. In Cambodia also, you had lots and lots of NGOs, I mean 70, 80 NGOs working on a relatively small scale. And when you add up all that's actually going on, it turns out to be not that much, that the coverage of the population is actually not, 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 so, not so terrific. What it, what it says is that you need to have contracts with a clear package of services and clear catchment areas uh, to make sure that there is broad coverage. Uh, you need to have clear objectives that are, are carefully monitored uh, so that everybody keeps focused on, on, uh, on the prize. Uh, and you need, to have, you need to do it on a large scale. Doing things on a small scale, I may, maybe people feel good, but I don't think it has the impact on the, on the population as a whole. And that means resources. I, you know, there's just no way to get around it. This is going to cost you money. Be serious. If you don't want to do it, fine. That's, that's, that's okay, but don't, don't, do it, don't do it half-baked. Um, there's clearly a stewardship role for government. Uh, and you can understand why the NGOs in Afghanistan you know, beforehand were completely uncoordinated. Who wanted to be coordinated by the Taliban? Awful, an awful, no, no credibility, an awful group of people to deal with. So they avoided, like the plague, dealing with the Taliban. Once the new government came in under the bond process, they had more credibility and I think had a really important role to play in terms of coordination, strategy, and actually doing the, the, the contracting. <clears throat> now, what about the sustainability and replicability of, of this approach of contracting with um, uh, NGOs? Uh, as I mentioned, I, I, you know, if it's four dollars per capita per year from a financial point of view, I don't think that it, there's, there's a huge issue of, of sustainability. Um, <clears throat> from a, there's this big issue that everybody brings up about you have to build the state. And there was a lot of discussion about this early on in, in Afghanistan. You have to build the state that because of, of you know, the wars uh, going on for you know, a quarter of a century, it was really important to you know, have the state delivering services and everybody seeing the state to deliver services. I think that can be exaggerated. Uh, and uh, some focus group discussions and, and research that a lot of people have done indicates people in the community actually don't care who's delivering services. Whether it's NGOs or the government, what they want are the services. Not unreasonable, right? Um, and the way this was partly dealt with in Afghanistan is that all the NGOs had a standard uh, signboard in front of their health centers which said, you know, uh, Ministry of Public Health with assistance from, you know, done by this NGO. And it, you know, for anybody who could read, it said Ministry of Public Health, Government of Afghanistan. So uh, I think that uh, this thing about building state as in, in order to build the state, the state has to deliver services. Um, my sense is, is uh, I, this can be greatly exaggerated. I look at the other sectors in Afghanistan. Um, I think that it's been very difficult for our education colleagues to really, um, they've expanded services. I'm not sure they've done much about the quality of the education services. And I think they face some really serious problems having to go through government. Uh, so there's a choice. I mean, I, I, and it's, it's not an easy choice. Uh, but this idea that governments have to deliver the services uh, at least needs to be questioned. Now, my sense that the biggest threat to using NGOs is really um, politicians and clientelism. That uh, people uh, want to provide jobs for their supporters, their, their family members, etc. And that providing these jobs is really one of the functions of government that nobody talks about. If you want to deliver services, that's one thing. If you want to be an employment agency, um, that's quite a different role. Uh, but that's really what drives a lot of these things. And I, I think that's part of the, the resistance that I see 
to working with NGOs has a lot to do with this. Um, also, uh, Ministry of Health officials want control. They, and sometimes it's benign, sometimes they want to be able to say, well, we did this, this is, you know, we have the ability to do it and, and uh, want to show that they have the, the capacity. Other times they want to control it for nefarious reasons. Uh, it's a way of, of being able to steal money, etc. Um, there's also an issue of, for a lot of people, this is a new way of doing business. And I think in Afghanistan there's a real age, there's a real age uh, division. Uh, people under 40 have no problem with working with NGOs. Many of them worked with NGOs in the past, so have no problem with this. People who are above 50 um, just cannot get their head around this. This is, this is heavy, heavy going for them. Okay, so um, if you don't mind, I, I just some, some suggestions for USAID in fragile states about working, working with NGOs. And I realize that um, what I'm, I may be saying is, is constrained by um, Congress and other rules and regulations that USAID faces, but uh, I'll, I'll say it anyway, at least uh, to be provocative. My, my mother said to me, if you can't be bright, at least be provocative. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll hopefully provoke in a good way. Um, so my sense is um, uh, uh, in post-conflict settings, uh, do more and more systematic contracting with NGOs. Uh, and uh, I think the, the experience of USAID in Afghanistan suggests a way of doing this that is not, not that complicated, not, not that difficult, and even within the realm of, of the rules and regulations it, it um, faces. Continue to, continuous and sustained financing. Uh, there is it's impossible to sign contracts year after year. I mean, a year-long contract is meaningless. If you're going to do this, do this for four or five years at the minimum. Uh, contracts really are about relationships. But, uh, relationships between NGOs and the community, between governments and NGOs, between USAID and NGOs. You cannot build these relationships year on year. Uh, so it just, it takes time. Uh, and so being able to provide continuous sustained financing is one way of, of, of doing this. Um, focus on outputs and outcomes, not on inputs. Um, this may sound obvious, but in fact, the way in which um, generally USAID has worked <coughs> is reimbursement of, of NGO expenditures. I have to say, I know that, that the, this may go up a huge constraint. Um, we in the World Bank are blessed that we have lump sum contracts, or can use lump sum contracts fairly easily. And lump sum contracts are fabulous, because they, no, none of us are so smart that we can figure in advance where the problems are going to lie and what needs to be where. And a lump sum contract allows you to reallocate resources to where you think the needs are and come up with creative solutions to those. So uh, having a lump sum contract seems to me a much better way of doing business than, uh, than reimbursement. Um, uh, I was talking to an NGO, a French NGO called AMI. I went up there. They're working in Samangan province. and. Um, uh, I said, I understand that working on these PPAs was a big problem for you guys. I said, oh yes, it nearly split the organization. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, um, you know, frankly, two words, World Bank. If the World <laughs> Bank was in favor of, of this approach, there were a lot of the organization who had wanted nothing to have to do with it. So I said, well, a year into this, how do you feel now? I said, this is the way to do, do business. I said, why? I said, you know, we have the freedom to, we have clear clear goals, we're working with the government and for the government, and yet we have the freedom to figure out what the best way of working is, and uh, lump sum contracts really make that easier. Um, each NGO contract should be fairly large. I think that there are significant economies of scale, and not just from the financial point of view. I think in terms of contract management, there is no government, and uh, I don't even, you cannot, you know, manage a hundred small little contracts. It's just too hard to do. So have fewer 10, 15 contracts, that's manageable. A um, hundred contracts is really difficult to do. Uh, evaluation becomes easier if you have smaller, uh, if you have larger and fewer number of contracts. Um, uh, getting people together just for a meeting is, 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 is feasible. So from lots of different points of view, I think uh, uh, you know, there are significant economies of scale. Make the contracts larger. If people want to subcontract, uh, okay, uh, let, them, let them try that. Uh, consider performance-based bonuses. Uh, I know that uh, MSH and USAID have worked on performance-based bonuses in Haiti, so it can be done. Um, I would say in Afghanistan, the, the experience with this has been pretty good. It's very difficult to isolate the, the impact of performance-based bonuses itself. 
I think it does have one really important value, and that is to get people to focus on the indicators of success. Uh, make sure that everybody is on board in terms of, of where, the, where things uh, should lie. Uh, geographic division of responsibilities among donors is, I think, is very helpful and avoids real confusion. There was one province, uh, Badris, in, in Afghanistan, where the um, government uh, issued a contract to bid uh, uh, for NGOs to bid on, and they were about to select an NGO, and then KFW, the German German Development Bank, came in and said, "Oh no, 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 no! We're financing an NGO that works in half of Badris province, so you can't." Anyway, it turned out it was a nightmare, and that. And the, the work in Badris never really took off until the NGO that was working with the government actually took over the whole whole province. So um, having clear def definition of, of geographic responsibilities to me I think is, is worth worthwhile. Um, follow the government's lead and course money through the government. Now I know that sounds crazy, but uh, I think that uh, with some care and attention, financial management can be done and it's a question of setting up the systems to do it. Uh, it's not it's it's not easy. It's not cheap. I, I think it can be done. Uh, with due due respect to my colleagues at MSH, I used to work for MSH. I should put that as I. Uh, um, I, I think there's um, there is a need for external technical assistance, and, and I, I don't want to minimize that. I think that even in Afghanistan, a place which was famous quote famous for its lack of technical assistance or, or you know capacity locally. Uh, there are a lot of talented people available if you're willing to pay reasonable wages. And uh, I think that a nice combination of a few highly skilled uh, international types along with a core group of talented local types can do amazing things, really amazing things. Uh, and then lastly, um, procurement. I, I know it's very difficult for USAID to let go of, of procurement of drugs. Uh, the results of the balanced scorecard indicate that NGOs can do a very good job of, of procurement and getting it out to the periphery. Uh, and um, it's something that it's probably easier. The SM provinces, they, they had to centralize their procurement. It went through a, a procurement agent. It was very difficult to, uh, for them, and it's still something that they're, they're struggling with. Um, the PPA NGOs, there's never stock outs. I've never been to a, uh, uh, a facility uh, where they've, there's been a shortage of drugs or family planning supplies. It's really quite remarkable. And we're now doing a, a study to look at, at quality. It seems to me it's worthwhile at least decentralizing procurement to the NGOs. Anyway, let me stop there. Thank you very much for your patience. Okay, we shift gears a little bit, but we're not shifting countries. Um, I'm going to talk about Im improving health and building hope through partnerships based on my own personal on-the-ground experience with MSH's project in Afghanistan. I will be referring to REACH, which stands for the Rural Expansion of Afghanistan's Community-Based Health Care. Huge name. But REACH was the name of the, the um, USAID-funded contract that MSH implemented in Afghanistan. And I want to say how wonderful it is to be here. It's, it's one of my first ventures back to Washington after returning from Afghanistan, and it's wonderful to see so many friends here, both from the old days and also friends from Afghanistan. So thank you all for coming. Um, I think it's um, really wonderful how well Benjamin has set the stage for what I want to try to convey in um, the time allotted to me today. Um, and he's allowed me to avoid a lot of explanation, I think, about how the project uh, was, was set up and how the contracting mechanism worked. Um, when you go into a post-conflict fragile state, um, there's a lot of pressure to change the slide. There we go. Um, and one of the challenges presented to MSH when we went in was trying to bridge the gap in, in um, the healthcare system all at once. Um, do everything that you can all at once. Uh, just a small map of Afghanistan. I don't think any of you need to get the setting, but, but just to show that it's surrounded by Pakistan, Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and a little bitty, tiny border with China. Um, landlocked country, lots of geographic uh, challenges presented there. 
But the three um, challenge areas that I would like to focus on today are areas that MSH through the REACH project worked on. And those are the challenges of access to services, um, the challenge of capacity of the various partners that we were working with on the ground, and a number of outdated or even non-existent systems and policies. The partners that um, Benjamin has already mentioned and the partners that we worked very closely with included the Ministry of Health, the donor community, contractors like ourselves, and a large number of non-governmental organizations, both Afghan and international. Um, collaboration amongst the partners in Afghanistan um, is some, was some of the best that I've seen, continues to be some of the best I've seen anywhere in the world, and rather remarkable, I think, for a, a post-conflict setting. And um, the collaboration um, worked through a consensus process, and I think it's worth ex uh, spending just a little bit of time explaining the process for the development of or, or uh, assessment of policies and the assessment and development of technical aspects of the program, task forces and work groups were set up by the ministry that included all the various partners and stakeholders. Um, draft proposals were developed by these task forces and working groups and submitted to a consultative group on health and nutrition, which was, again, a group made up of the various stakeholders and partners operating in Afghanistan. Often, the drafts would go back to the working groups for more work, many times in some cases, before the consultative group, group signed off and passed the new um, policy or new guidelines or standards to a technical advisory group, a smaller group, again, appointed by the ministry made up of the various stakeholders. Once the technical advisory group had signed off and approved, then the, the issue went before the Ministry of Public Health Executive Board for final approval. And I, um, Benjamin mentioned the basic package of health services. There was also an essential package of hospital services, both of which were developed uh, very early um, post-Taliban the basic package particularly, which is already in its second edition. But these came out of that process, and these are really the foundational documents um, on which all of the health work that, that Benjamin so nicely explained um, was based. And, and these were the guides that were used to, by all of the NGOs and all of the other partners who were delivering services to plan and implement their services. Just a little bit of background about the REACH project. It was a USAID contract. It lasted for two plus years. It's currently in a no cost extension just to finish up one of the small uh, sub agreements that was uh, being carried out there. A total of $138 million, one of USAID's largest, I think. Um, very complex project. Um, Benjamin already mentioned that um, the REACH project did uh, service delivery grants with NGOs both Afghan and international. We worked with 19 different NGOs in 13 provinces, and this covers about a third of the population of Afghanistan. MSH's work also included extensive technical assistance and training, and the technical assistance and training was designed to strengthen the capacity of different partners and at different levels. For example, we had major assistance um, with the Central Ministry of Public Health in a number of areas. In, in the field of building systems, health management information, finance, human resource. Um, we also worked in about half of the provincial health departments to assist them in doing health planning <coughs> at the provincial level and also to reestablish provincial health coordination committees, again made up of the various stakeholders and partners operating at the provincial level. We provided extensive technical assistance also to our NGO partners in a number of areas uh, that related to their performance on the grants and contracts. In addition, REACH staff um, participated in most and led in some of the systems and policy development initiatives with the Central Ministry of Public Health. So that's just by way of sort of setting the stage and expanding a little bit on what Benjamin has already told you. But if we focus now on the, the um, challenges that I mentioned uh, before, the challenge of access to services. Um, going into um, a fragile state, a post-conflict state, you find um, very inadequate or damaged infrastructure. 
Um, one of the th first things that we did, and I'll talk about it in a minute, was an assessment, a nationwide assessment, to look at what remained on the ground after 20 <coughs> plus years of con uh, conflict. Um, there were limited clinical staff available um, in Afghanistan, and we addressed that challenge in the REACH project. And then, of course, the geographic and security constraints, uh, Benjamin already alluded to some of those in terms of getting services to the people. Well, how did we address, what was our response to this particular challenge? As I mentioned first, uh, very soon after the Taliban left, um, MSH was invited in and, and one of our first efforts was to do a nationwide assessment of what, is, what was on the ground, what was available in terms of buildings, equipment, supplies, and people. Um, this was uh, followed by planning for and starting up rebuilding efforts and one of the most important and first efforts was to really restart an earlier community-based health initiative. And in this instance, MSH was fortunate to be able to build upon experience that we had had in and with Afghanistan for several decades. Um, during, during the Soviet period and, and shortly thereafter, we were working cross-border from Peshawar in Pakistan to try to keep the community-based health system going. And we were able to build on that nicely when we were invited back to work through the REACH contract. Um, we were able um, to train and deploy over 6,000 community health workers. A cadre of worker that's mandated by the basic package of health service services, which in, in fact includes a job description as one of the annexes for these community health workers. I want to... Um, tell the story of this particular community health worker who didn't want to be photographed with her face showing, so she pulled her burqa down. But she's pointing to a community map, and this is a map of the area that she serves, and she's pointing to a cluster of pins on the map. These pins are identifying a cluster of women who have TB. Now, TB is a disease unusually of uh, women in Afghanistan. There are more women with TB than men, and that's quite an unusual profile. But I, I point this story out because it's moving to me that by putting female community health workers on the ground in the village, they're able to identify a group of patients who probably never would have seen a health worker or been identified in the old days. So uh, to me, I, I, I really like this picture because I think it demonstrates what you can do at the community level to make a huge difference very quickly in a post-conflict setting. Some more responses to the access question. Benjamin commented on getting drug supplies into facilities. Um, unlike the, the bank approach in the USAID REACH approach, uh, we procured contra uh, contraceptives and, and other drugs uh, centrally and stocked them through the NGOs. But there were huge seasonal and geographic constraints. Um, and one of the uh, significant things that happened was working with the NGOs to help them appreciate the importance of stocking in before winter weather, before the spring floods. Um, and a significant policy a cha a change that occurred just last year that I think will be of interest to the Office of Population folks. We were able to encourage the government to change its policy about how many cycles of oral contraceptives could be given at one time from one per visit or from one per contact with a community health worker to six cycles. It made a huge difference for women who were unable to get out of their homes for a large part of the year because of these um, geographic and climatic constraints. Always in a presentation like this, when I say I've just come back from Afghanistan, people say, what about the security situation? So I just uh, put this in because it, it is an issue related to access. And Benjamin commented in the, in the one slide that showed um, the per capita health contacts. Um, we were very fortunate. REACH was a huge project. We had over a thousand staff. We had uh, regional offices in six different parts of the country. And we had a fabulous and very professional security team who worked with us to constantly scan and alert us to security concerns and take appropriate precautions in terms of saying, no, you don't travel to that area this particular <coughs> month. You postpone that trip until next month. Um, the next area of challenge is the whole capacity issue. Um, many, uh, Benjamin already mentioned the Ministry of Public Health staff who uh, we met when we first went in post-Taliban. These were wonderful 
battlefield surgeons and frontline Mujahideen clinicians who had been picked up to serve their country. Um, they were enthusiastic, they were excited about the work, but they were not trained in management and leadership skills. This was a whole new area for them. And so one of the capacity challenges that we had was how to begin to build leadership and management skills among this group uh, in the Ministry of Health. They also needed to rapidly um, staff up technical units and um, because of the years of conflict, a lot of the technical expertise was outdated, limited. Um, there had been limited opportunity for continuing education during the war, war years. That was a challenge for us. Um, the the um, NGO grantees, as Benjamin pointed out, um, were required both in the, in the bank process and also in the USAID process to bid to receive the grants that were made. And in many cases, especially for the local Afghan NGOs, these were inexperienced groups. Many had uh, never bid for grants before. Uh, many had not even worked in health before. But they were there to serve the needs of their people and willing to learn and able to learn. So we were dealing with those challenges as well. Some of our responses were um, providing continuous support to build management and leadership skills at the central ministry, as I already mentioned. But also, we focused on those provinces where we were working and a few additional provinces in terms of assisting the provincial level ministry staff with planning and local coordination, helping them to reform or to establish afresh the provincial health coordinating committees made up of all the partners that were working at the provincial level. And they differed from province to province depending <coughs> on who was there. In some cases, in addition to the ministry staff, uh, and donor staff, if they happened to be on the ground. We were working with the UN agency representatives. We were working in those uh, coordinating committees with the NGOs, of course. But also we were working with the military in a number of the provinces, provincial reconstruction teams that were fielded by the different military um, groups that were in country were partners at the provincial level. And then a third area that MSH spent a lot of time on in REACH was uh, building local health committees. And these committees were formed and trained to give oversight to community-based health service delivery. Further in the capacity area, we worked very hard to establish training programs for new staff. And Benjamin mentioned the importance of female midwives, particularly community-level midwives, um, were trained and were, were selected from their own communities and trained to go back and work in those communities. And in this culture where women and their families insist that women be seen by women. This was a huge contribution. Uh, the REACH program alone, um, through its contracts with training institutions, uh, was able to produce 800 new midwives in the course of the three years. Um, that's contrasted to less than 500 who remained in the country when we first started <coughs> our work. So adding another 800 community midwives and hospital midwives made a huge difference. We also established a refresher training course for doctors, nurses, midwives, and ancillary staff, something that they had totally missed during the war years, and something that made a huge contribution to getting the quality of services back up to a certain standard. And then, uh, as I already mentioned, we provided continuous and targeted technical assistance for our NGO partners who were on the ground delivering services. And this was technical assistance both in management grant management, financial management, supervision, collection and use of data, but also in clinical services <coughs> through quality assurance interventions, continuing education, drug supply management, et cetera. Now in the area of systems and policies, um, I think I mentioned already the limited and outdated policies. And the government and the Ministry of Public Health were really keen to address this. They recognized that they needed to do a lot of work in policy <coughs> development and system development. Quality assurance is an area that I've often been, when I make these sorts of presentations, been questioned, or at least some people raise the issue. In a post-conflict and crisis fragile situation, can you afford the, uh, afford the luxury of addressing quality while you're also rebuilding the health service system? So that was a challenge for us. And then the lack of base data, uh, population or program data, was something that we had to address through the REACH program. I already mentioned the 
basic package and the essential package of hospital services, foundational policies, a major response that all the partners work together to create. Um, but also on the quality side, the REACH program uh, was able to identify, uh, sorry, to introduce the fully functional service delivery point and the performance and quality improve improvement methodologies, the first for clinics and this, the latter for hospitals. These are both standards-based uh, quality improvement initiatives that were used in the program to measure progress. Just a quick uh, look at some before and after pictures. Um, these are pictures from the fully functional service delivery point sites. Um, and these, this, this methodology was used throughout the country. But you see, can I borrow your pointer a minute? Sure. <laughs> Thanks. You see the before and after. Um, the waste disposal in one of the clinics, and afterwards, after they had built an incinerator, which they used to dispose of waste. And here again, the water system for one health facility and a well with a pump following. Uh, small responses, but similar responses were also um, achieved in quality improvements. Uh, we could document changes in better direct patient care, supervision, and overall management of the facilities through the use of these uh, quality systems. And the fully functional service delivery point system has actually been adopted for use nationally by the Ministry of Public Health. So hopefully in the near future all clinics will, will be able to uh, benefit from this quality improvement initiative. Um, in response to the lack of data, lack of information and, and um, service data, um, Benjamin mentioned the National Health Management <coughs> Information. Um, this is something that MSH and the other partners work together with the ministry to develop. Um, it's a routine health management information system that's used now nationally. Um, it's managed at the Central Ministry of Health and also decentralized to, to some of the provinces um, so that the data feeds in from the, actually from the community level and from the health facilities to the province and then to headquarters. Um, in addition, REACH undertook uh, in partnership with its NGO grantees, a household survey of key health and 10 key health indicators. We used the lot quality assurance sampling methodology, um, and we think that probably our experience in Afghanistan is one of the largest, maybe the largest use of this methodology yet anywhere in the world. Um, time doesn't allow me to, to actually go into detail of that methodology. Maybe that's a subject for another presentation because we were quite pleased with how well it worked for us there. Um, but uh, just to show you some of the results of these introduction of these systems, th these are data from the National Health Management Information System. And we see here uh, <coughs> contraceptive um, protection and the fact that it's increasing both at the health facilities and at the community level. But while there's an overall fourfold increase, um, there's an eightfold increase in the contribution of the community health workers outlined in the blue. Um, just uh, to show the load that the community health workers are able to take off of the static facilities that are still grossly understaffed simply because there aren't trained staff available in the field. Um, I think the introduce, introduction of the community health worker approach as outlined in the basic <coughs> package is something that um, we can be very proud of and something that um, has made a major contribution to increasing access to health services. From our lot quality assurance sampling uh, household survey, I have here just three key <coughs> indicators um, I, uh, by way of showing you that over a two year period, we increased contraceptive prevalence, 10 percentage points. And keep in mind, these are data from rural, hard to reach parts of <coughs> Afghanistan. These do not include any urban data. Um, births attended by skilled birth attendants increased almost 10 percentage points and children fully immunized. And our definition of full, full immunization was different from the slide, uh, the mixed definition that, that Benjamin showed. We required evidence. Um, we required <coughs> seeing the vaccination card of the child. Um, and you can see a two and a half fold increase there. Um, these are statistically significant changes in a two year period. Six of the other seven indicators showed statistically significant changes. And I have a handout actually with my colleague Amanda, she'll pass it around, um, that shows the, the overall picture of, of the um, end of 
uh, baseline and end of project household surveys. Um, these are small advances. Um, they happened in a two year period in part of Afghanistan. But I feel that they set the stage for a more rapid impact. I think both the data that Benjamin showed and what I've showed you here um, is going to begin to show people, to demonstrate to people that they, that they can see improvements of their, in their lives based on the improvements in, in better health outcomes. And they'll also therefore begin to have more confidence in the system. And by that I mean the Ministry of Public Health System through its NGO um, implementers, the overall government system. They'll feel that the government is working for them and that they have hope for their <coughs> own futures and their children's futures. <coughs> I think what I've presented here, based uh, again on, on the foundation that Benjamin presented, um, is a snapshot of the changes which are taking place through partnerships between many folks on the ground in Afghanistan, the ministry, the donors, those providing services, and the population themselves who are using services. And I think that together all we can hope is that these advances are maintained and enhanced over time so that it won't be much longer before most people will be able to say, my life is changing, and we have a new hope in the future. Um, my colleague put my contact information here. I have cards if anybody wants them. And um, I think that what we've done together, all of the partners in Afghanistan, has, has begun to meet what MSH uh, has as our mission, and that is closing the gap between what is known about public health problems and what is done to solve them. Thank you all. Just pass those around. Okay. Thank you very much, Sally, and thank you, Benjamin. We have some from time for Q and A. I ask if you will let one of my colleagues get to you before you start your question with a with a microphone, so you can tell us who you are, and the folks on the on the video can hear your question as well. Uh, so, who would like to kick us off? Yeah, Will. Willa Pressman, um, <clears throat> the Office of Regional and Country Support um, and Global Health. I'm, I'm wondering if, from both of you, uh, do you think if the government continues to contract with NGOs that the international NGOs should be working themselves out of a job and setting up local NGOs to continue the services? Uh, let me start uh, on that. I guess uh, my sense is yes, I guess the international NGOs should be working themselves out of a job, and I think that they probably will be. Uh, particularly if you have uh, a system or a, a selection process that's based at least partly on cost, uh, local NGOs have such an advantage when it comes to cost. So I think they 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 will in fact uh, be more more and more local NGOs. And I think we actually see this. I mean, I, I don't know what the uh, the 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 later rounds of of reach. I think also there were more and more uh, local NGOs involved, and that's certainly been the experience with the World Bank financed uh, PPAs that the government has let that more and more of them are are local NGOs, and it stands to reason. Um, uh, you know the cost structure. I remember I was in Islamabad recently. I was talking to uh, Aga Khan Development Network, and I, when I talked about the four dollars per capita per year, they said, "No, that's not possible. You can't do that." And okay, well, you know, I, I know I know exactly what the NGOs in Afghanistan are spending, and um, uh, yes, they can do it for that. Uh, you know, one of the the one of the things that's been really pleasant for me is watching, uh, say, BRAC. Um, you know, sort of a, a regional NGO uh, work in Afghanistan, I think they've done first-rate work. I don't know what's in the water at BRAC, but these people have been doing uh, fantastic work uh, in difficult circumstances and thriving on it. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I think and it, I'm getting the mix right. It's not that all the international NGOs should leave. I think that uh, there are some interesting ideas that they provide and, and contacts. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, sooner or later, I think there are more and more local NGOs that will, will take over. I totally agree. I think in the last round of contracting for the the NGO grants that followed REACH, um, there were more local Afghan NGOs who won won the contracts than than international. And to be perfectly honest, performance among the local NGOs in our experience was better than the international NGOs. So I think that bodes well for the future of, of using NGOs in Afghanistan at least. The only NGO contract that I'm aware of that was terminated was an Italian NGO. 
Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. This is Anwar Islam from ESD, uh, Extending Service Railway Project. I had one question for uh, Benjamin, you know, that you were talking about initially, you know, that reasons to worry, wrong gender, wrong skills, and wrong location. Now, after these years, you know, that how do you think these three wrongs are being righted, you know, to, to what extent? The second question, you know, that uh, you talked about the balanced scorecard card that GHU, you know, that uh, Johns Hopkins is using with 27 variables or something like that. Uh, do you have anything that we can take and look at it, you know, what are those uh, things, you know, that uh, I'm sure that they are rating or weighting different variables differently, you know, that if we can have that, you know, that, that will give some ideas. And one for MSH, you know, that as we go, you know, at the end of breach, you know, what is next, you know, that uh, what uh, USAID is doing or what MSH is doing and how do you see the future, you know, that of sustainability as Benjamin initially talked about. Thank you. Um, I guess if, I'll, I, if I can start on the, on the three wrongs, um, I think they're increasingly right, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, let's, on gender. Uh, I think the training of the community midwives has really helped a lot, uh, and it's created a, a cadre of health workers uh, who are from those provinces and from the rural areas, uh, and I think that, that it provides a, a great deal of hope. And, and the, the data I presented about just the number of health facilities with trained female staff increasing significantly, I, I think, is, is testimony to that. Um, uh, secondly, about getting them out of Kabul and the other big cities into the rural areas, uh, I think also that's worked quite well. I think that uh, it's uh, partly a reflection of paying them reasonable salaries, uh, but also the flexibility that NGOs can use. One NGO manager said, you know what really works well? DVDs. You know, I don't care what it takes. If, if, if it takes DVD players to get uh, trained health workers into rural areas, it's cheap. It's cheaper than lots of other things, uh, and certainly cheaper than not having them there. Um, in terms of the skills, uh, I think that, and this is this is surprising to me. I actually think that the Ministry of Public Health has done a pretty reasonable job of increasing the standards and changing the standards for health workers, so that what was very confusing before is much more uh, sensible now than it was. And a lot of it has to do with folks uh, that worked uh, with MSH uh, in the Ministry of Public Health to, to strengthen that sort of standard-based training so, and, and, and uh, 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 qualification. So I, I think, in fact, um, uh, the, the NGOs and the ministry have gone a long way towards addressing the three wrongs. And I know that this is a hot topic in much of Africa about, about human resource development. I have to say that everything that I see in Afghanistan points in the right direction to me provides a, a, a useful model for how this, these issues can be addressed. Um, on the balanced scorecard, I know that uh, colleagues from Hopkins and the Ministry of Public Health are just publishing a, uh, an article in the uh, bulletin of the WHO uh, on the this, uh, B, uh, balanced scorecard. Uh, I tell you what, I'll send to Gib and, and others uh, the, um, the reports of the last two balanced scorecards and, and perhaps you can, uh, you can send it around to anybody who's on the, on the list. Um, so yeah, it is th those things are available and you can see exactly what goes into the, the balance work. On the what next and sustainability question, thank you for that question. Um, and maybe some of my USAID colleagues want to comment. Um, REACH had a midterm external evaluation. And one of the concerns of that team was this is too big. It's, it's much too much for one contractor to handle. And granted, it was a huge project, and we had lots of deliverables. Um, in fact, in retrospect, I feel that, that it was absolutely right for the time in Afghanistan to try to bundle everything um, rather than farm it out. It gave us the opportunity to sort of do the assessment, see what was need, needed, and to begin addressing some of the needs. Um, following REACH, um, the various aspects of the REACH work have been subdivided into other, other um, entities. Um, so for example, MSH still is there, but we're focusing on the ministry capacity building at the central and provincial level. 
Um, the grants, as Benjamin pointed out, have now shifted over for the ministry to manage and the funding is channeled through the World Health Organization. Um, the um, work with building the capacity of NGOs to do better service delivery has uh, gone to Johns Hopkins um, in a program called SSP and the name is about this long. I don't know if anybody else can quote what SSP is. And then finally there is a social marketing component that um, is being primed by Futures Constella. So all of the various aspects that were, were being addressed in REACH are still there. They're just in different guises. On the sustainability question, one of the things that we worked very hard on in the last year of REACH um, was to try to hand over as much as we could in terms of systems that had evolved and that had been developed. Um, so that, for example, five months before REACH officially ended, the entire health management information system was actually handed over. A server was established within the ministry. We were running a parallel system for several years while the ministry was learning how to do it. Now they're doing the whole thing. Um, likewise, with some of our human resource management interventions, they're now based in the ministry rather than being done as, as a partnership. So I, I think that um, the future bodes well and that most of these activities will be carried on as before, just with different partners. I don't know if anybody from USAID wants to add anything to that mm -hmm. description. I had another question, if you're go, ready for it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Brenda Doe from the A&E Bureau and USAID. Um, I'm interested in the cost per capita per year and am wondering if you could elaborate on how you derive those numbers. And some of the more specific questions are, for example, uh, I understand that USAID funded the training of the midwives and I don't think the other donors did. So how did that factor into the cost per capita? And I think also that you say did more of the national level um, policy work and setting of standards and that the other donors did not fund that. So could you elaborate more on how you arrived at this? And one last part of it is now that more of the grants are going to local NGOs as opposed to international ones, would you expect the cost per capita from you say to decline? Um, okay, uh, the, uh, uh, the cost of training community midwives was in, in fact included in the PPA, so I think in, in that regard it's training like, uh, 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 comparing like with like. Uh, the, the costs are actually derived from what the values of the contracts were. So the, the, the contracts, the, the bidders put in, uh, submitted a financial bid at least for the PPAs, uh, I mean that that number comes from what the contracts actually said. It, you know, it worked out at you know uh, X million dollars, and if you do the math, that that's what it comes out as. Um, uh, for the the numbers from USAID, these were obtained from the GCMU, and, and it, it was mostly what the, what uh, Reach was paying to the uh, NGOs, uh, uh, you know, for the delivery of those services. Now, it included uh, some things, um, and I, I can't remember if, if the drugs were included or not. Was that, they were. Um, so I, the, the, the question you ask is an important one, and I don't mean to, to, to sort of gloss over it. Trying to figure out what the, the total all-in cost per capita were uh, is actually a more extensive effort than uh, what's been done to date, and I think it's worth the trouble. Uh, it does not include administrative costs, so that would be that would be separate, um, and it would be it would be an interesting and useful exercise to try and figure this out. One of the things that we found um, that there is no correlation between uh, the uh, actual expenditures and performance. That um, it's not, and, and I actually had an unpleasant phone call a few months ago with. Um, uh, an international NGO that was bidding on a, a, a fixed price uh, PPA in, in Badakhshan. And this particular NGO said, you cannot do it for $4.50 per capita per year, you're going to end up killing people. And was, that's, those were the words he used and I just said, I'm sorry, but I know what NGOs are, are, are spending uh, and um, 
uh, and we don't find any correlation between performance and and the uh, and the expenditures or performance and the price of the contracts. So um, trying to figure out what the real cost of service is. I assume that if you have ten dollars per capita, you hopefully can do more than you can for four dollars. I, I you know that would stand to reason, but for four dollars or for three and a half dollars. Uh, some people are doing exceptionally exceptionally good work under difficult circumstances. So the cost of services is actually a, a difficult difficult <coughs> thing to get at, uh, and um, I, I think that's why it's really worthwhile to do some more uh, uh, some more detailed work into this, because it has uh, implications for how the ministry in the future will cost the contracts and uh, how the if they want to use fixed prices, you know what those what the fixed prices will be. Um, I think there was another part of your question of uh, community midwives and, and then central Should and then sh uh, help to the international to local NGOs and what will that do to the cost? Oh uh, yes, um, well I, th I think in the long run I, I, that will hopefully drive the, the cost down somewhat. Although, uh, look, this is never going to be cheap. It's no, you're never going to do this realistically for a dollar per capita or even two dollars. Uh, so uh, I don't know what the true cost is. I guess it depends on, on um, we seem to be able to get fairly reasonable results for three and a half, four dollars per capita per year. And I'm not sure that the shift to local NGOs, it'll, it'll reduce the overhead costs somewhat, uh, but not, I mean, don't, don't think that this is suddenly going to go down to a dollar. I just, can I add to that? I think um, w one of the things that um, we have to remember is that that investment, at least in the REACH case, and I assume it's true for the others, includes the, the capital cost. I mean, reestablishing clinics and the equipment that that takes. Um, so the cost may come down a little bit if you begin to amortize the, the capital costs over time. Brenda, just to answer your question about the other REACH activities, they were not included in these costs. So these costs are just uh, REACH costs for the grants themselves plus drugs. And the, in other words, the midwifery training, were those, those were separate grants and they weren't part of this. Okay. Do you want to just do a follow-up, Brenda? Yeah, please. Just um, one last question then. I'm a little bit concerned, though, about the way this slide is presented here and making it, uh, I mean, obviously it looks like AIDS expenses were 30 percent higher than might have been necessary. Um, can you say that this is actually comparing apples and apples? Uh, does this account for quality? Um, would you caution us to use these figures with a little bit of care that this is not as precise as might be necessary? I, I am concerned that it would appear that aid has unnecessarily wasted expenses or wasted money on this. So I'd like your comments on that. Can I? Com <laughs> can I? Can I'd like to comment on it first because Brenda, it does include drugs, and we're by USAID regs we must purchase the drugs from certain places. Right, and, um, and, and I think the drugs in the other contracting mechanisms were locally purchased. Okay. So that, that could account for a considerable amount of that difference, yes. actually. In, in terms of quality, I mean, I, if you want, we can go back to the slide. Um, no, I think uh, that's, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, the, um, the results of the balanced scorecard would suggest uh, uh, that um, I think they have well, a copy there. Uh, so, well. Okay. If, so, if you look at, at uh, this this graph, um, the <coughs> balance scorecard, the change in the balance scorecard, this would be the same uh, same group of people analyzing the the the, the quality of care. So. The quality of care is roughly comparable. I, you know, I, 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 I don't even know if, if, if this is statistically different or not. I, I, I can find out. But uh, yes, okay. So uh, the, the quality of care is roughly similar. Uh, are the prices uh, uh, comparable? Uh, it, it's a worthwhile question to, to ask. And um, uh, I think Sally, Sally's right that uh, the, uh, the drugs may, may, may play a difference. Uh, it's not. It's an important issue to get at. Uh, trying to find out what services in Afghanistan actually cost at a reasonable level of quality uh, is is an important question for everybody to understand. And you know, when we started out, to be fair, nobody had any idea 
about what this was going to cost. You cannot look up in the yellow pages, sort of like, you know, say, phone around, get three prices from people who have experienced delivering uh, health services in Afghanistan. More is the pity. Bill Newbrander at MSH did what I think is a credible job trying to estimate what things would cost, roughly. Uh, I think his costs were a, a little on the high side, but not, not outrageous. Um, I think that uh, when uh, this NGO calls me up and says, you know, if you don't give us eight or nine dollars per capita per year, you're killing babies. Uh, no, that's being pretty outrageous. And remember that we had fixed pies to work with. If we spend more in one area, there is less money to go around in the other areas. So it's it's a it is a zero sum game that that you know at the, uh, where the rubber meets the road here. So trying to figure out efficient ways of delivering these services, I think, is important, and that's why competition, at least partly based on price, is is not an unreasonable thing to do in this context. Okay, I have a question here, and then we'll move over to Ritu and demo. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Karen Kavanaugh from USAID. Um, first, thank you very much for the presentations, both quite interesting. Um, when we speak about costs, I think that your point about the need to analyze these costs and learn more about them is quite valid. And in fact, I can tell you that your reputation has preceded you because I was in a meeting last week in Sweden where someone said, you know, uh, Bill Levinson from the World Bank is telling people you can deliver health care uh, for $4 per capita in a developing country. And one of your colleagues from the World Bank said he can't possibly be saying that the investing in health <laughs> document from 1993 said $12 and uh, Jeff Sachs said $34. So I think that this is a very important point that is worth exploring further. And in particular, what strikes me is not so much the difference between $4 and $6, but that they're so close. When you look at the universe of possibilities, I mean, you could have one at $4 and one at $35, and the $35 is what people would expect. And so you're coming up with unexpected findings, which I think are really worth pursuing further. Um, I'd like to uh, um, hear a little bit more from either or both of you on a couple points. One is uh, something that I observed when looking at the results of the MSH work in Haiti, and that is that the part of the value of the contracting process was linked to the information that individual actors had about how they were doing vis-a-vis -vis their peers. So that in the Haiti case, before they even built in the bonuses, they started to see improvements in performance because the NGOs started to benchmark themselves against one another and say, well, wait a minute, why am I not doing as well as so-and-so down the street? And so I'd be interested in your um, observations about that in Afghanistan. The other point um, that I wonder about, really, because I think that the external monitoring of performance is very important for good, good uh, contract management. But in an environment of such insecurity, how viable is it to have someone like Johns Hopkins coming in and doing uh, external performance monitoring? I wonder if you could comment a little bit about that. And then just a, a word of information or perhaps advertising. This same subject of pay for performance is the uh, focus of a Center for Global Development uh, meeting this Thursday, if people are interested in that. Um, it's going to be talking about uh, the experience in Haiti. Thank you. Those are such great questions. Can, no, I, can I take a crack? Um, thank you, Karen. Um, I, I am totally in sympathy with your point that the contracting process and the sharing of information is really an incentive in itself. And one of the things that, um, that REACH did with, with our NGO partners was we had quarterly or at least twice a year meetings bringing them all together where they shared. Um, and what we found, at least that was interesting to me, was that the NGOs that had experience in working in a certain area, let's say one of the NGO contractors was particularly focused on maternal health, um, were able to share their past experience pre-reach with their colleagues who had not worked in that area before. Likewise, family planning exchange across. But when we did the baseline household survey and looked at the data by NGO and by, by district and province, um, that was the biggest incentive for, and, and one of the reasons that we did it was so that the NGOs would not only have a baseline but be able to set viable targets. So if they were low at baseline in a particular indicator, 
they could go to their colleague NGOs who had done a very good job on that indicator and say, what's the secret? You know, how do you, how do you get to this? So regular exchange among the NGOs, and we also did a monthly newsletter um, that went out to all the NGOs, I think was a huge incentive for performance and, um, and to be encouraged. I mean, the influence of competition was really there. Um, just on the external performance monitoring, um, I, I agree with the question about Johns Hopkins. That was one of the reasons that we chose to use LQAS. And in fact, the NGOs did their own household surveys. And somebody said, okay, well, how do you deal with bias? But we built in a number of quality um, checks throughout the process, both in sampling and during, during the, um, the household surveys. But the interesting thing was that the NGOs working in the REACH area said, hey, we really like this methodology. We're going to use it in the World Bank areas or in the, in the EU areas. So in fact, they've taken the ownership of this methodology and, and ways of analyzing their own work. Um, and using it as a tool for management, actually, setting targets and then measuring against those targets. So I'd love to do a, a session on LQAS, and I think there are probably some other people in the community that would like to be part of that. Um, I think it's an exciting tool that we ought to be considering using a lot more to get to outcome measures in a very short period of time. Um, <clears throat> a couple of thoughts. First of all, on the $4 per capita per year. Um, yeah, I uh, no, I, I stick by this. I you know, uh, it's <laughs> it, it's the, this is the real money that we're paying out. I mean, I get the financial reports, so I, I'm really sorry. And and I have to say, both uh, Jeffrey Sachs, a very wise economist, and my colleagues at the World Bank, who did the WDR in 1993, their costs were based on on models, right? I mean, they fi they tried to figure out what these things would cost in this setting. Uh, the market has spoken. Right? That's, it's very interesting. I mean, economists believe in markets, so the market has spoken. There was a competitive bidding process. This is what people bid. They knew that they had, were responsible for a certain amount of, of uh, uh, service delivery, and this is the price that came out. And, and, and luckily for me, this is not the only place where this has happened. Uh, the results from Cambodia suggest roughly the same thing. Uh, $4, $4.5 per capita per year to deliver a similar package of services. So I, I think this can be done. If it really is $35, if Jeffrey Sachs is right and I'm completely wrong, then $35 per capita per year, basically the world walks away and says, that's nuts, that's completely unaffordable. And I think that we shouldn't let them off the hook. $4 is affordable and it's still, we're not even meeting $4, right? Tell, show me the country, especially the conflict poor country, that's getting this kind of investment uh, and I, I'm, I'd be, I'd be thrilled. So uh, I, I'm not going to give up on this. Uh, and uh, data also from Guatemala shows similar costs. So I don't, I don't think it's unreasonable. Uh, on the question about the, the benchmarking, I, I, think, I think this is exactly right. And it's one of the things that I actually think explains the good performance of the uh, MOPH strengthening mechanism in, in Afghanistan, that the government was also knew that they were being benchmarked. They were going to be compared to um, the NGO performance, and that's why these guys are pulling out all the stops. I see the Ministry of Health folks working very hard to make sure that they are not embarrassed. Part of the reason they chose the easy provinces near Kabul was that they wanted to make sure that they didn't have a, you know, uh, a, a dis they weren't at a disadvantage, and I, I think that this is part of what, what's spurring them on. Um, yeah, I think it's really, it's really advantageous, and it's, and it's the best kind of competition, right? It's competition based on who can provide good health services to poor people in remote areas. What, what better competition is there? I mean, it, 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 it beats the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I ask Benjamin a question? Because sure. is that all right? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Come on, they're eager and, people. And, yeah, it's only, it's only I never hear mention in um, the other models about the use of community health workers. Uh, are, is, are the bank uh, provinces using community health workers according to BPHS? Uh, yes, uh, and, and a lot. Um, and I know that uh, Johns Hopkins is doing an evaluation of you know, how the community health workers are doing. I really liked your slide because it's consistent with what I hear from the NGOs that uh, community health workers are probably responsible for more than half of contraceptive prevalence. So I think that, that uh, I, I think it's actually working quite well. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, um, uh, you know, uh, thinking about sort of how to sustain those uh, community health workers uh, in the in the long run, and uh, I think that's a that's a, a constant constant source of 
of questioning about what's going to keep them these people working in the community for a while. Um, hi, I'm Ritu Singh from the Office of Population and Global Health. Um, and I'm interested in building systems in fragile settings, building systems for health service delivery. And it seems like through your presentation, there are four systems that are up there. Now, would you say that we replicate all four of these models in the next fragile state setting? I mean, is there one that's better than other? I mean, as a World Bank representative and as USAID project, you know, what, how, how would you replicate this? I, uh, I, I, um, I'm not sure they're so terribly different. I mean, because they all use this as the model. This, this is what service delivery looks like in Afghanistan. And as far, as far as I know, there hasn't been deviation in any of the models from this basic package. I think that uh, the deviation was only a convenience based on the decision of the various donors that they would cover different parts of the country and their models are slightly different. But I, I don't know, Benjamin, how would you You know, yeah, I, to me, I mean, I, I, what, what's similar? I mean, I, I think the, um, Having clear objective indicators of success is really important and it's part of the real advantage of a contract rather than a grant that the people who are doing the contracting, whether it's the Ministry of Health or USAID, get to set a, a clear set of indicators against which to judge performance. I think that's one of the big advantages. So people should spend a lot of time on that. I would say that our uh, uh, EC colleagues did not spend enough time on that and they paid the price for it. Um, uh, so that's one. Uh, second is that people have to have clear, clearly demarcated geographical areas. And no disagreement, there's no difference between the, 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 the uh, 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 approaches in, in that regard. Uh, third, uh, you need to evaluate those things as best you can, and I think it's still worth the trouble uh, to get in third party evaluation. Um, is there one model that works better than others? Uh, I, they're pretty similar. Uh, the uh, I happen to think that in the long run, competition, at least partly based on price, will get you the the best ways, the most efficient ways of delivering services. Uh, unfortunately, you know, sort of in the in the short term, it, it can cause some hiccups about people underbidding in order to get contracts or things areas that look pretty similar, giving you different, very different costs. But uh, you know, I, but th th that's really at the margins. I think. Having a clear package of services, a uh, clear agreement on the indicators, cl clear geographical area, uh, and monitoring and evaluation pretty rigorously, those will get you where you want to go. What about capacity building of the government? Mm -hmm. Do you think that was done better in one system rather than the other? Oh, God, that's a uh, tough question to ask. I, I, Capacity building. Here's how I judge capacity building. Uh, capacity is the ability to deliver health services. Uh, and uh, the results indicate that health services are definitely improving. And I'm not sure yet. Uh, I guess we'll see, soon see sort of whether one model did better in, in delivering those services. In terms of the, the, the Ministry of Public Health's ability to manage contracts, well, uh, I mean, USAID and, and the EC, at least initially, didn't have uh, the, the ministry managing the contracts. And partly it, it has to do with the way the, the organizations are structured. Uh, the World Bank is in the position where we, we're not an implementing agency. We can't, there's, there's no other option for us but to go through the Ministry of Public Health. I, I, it turns out that that may be a good idea in any case, but it was, it's partly a matter of necessity. We don't have, we don't have the option of doing it, uh, doing it any differently. Um, but, you know, I think that the, the lessons from Afghanistan are fascinating. It's a, it's a huge piece of operational research. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it, has, it has generally a happy outcome. Right in front, you've been very patient and waiting right in front of Ritu. Well, I had a question on the contracting, which has been tried in a lot of places. Uh, it's being tried all out, all through Central America, and a lot of it by the World Bank. Um, and this is one of the really rapid success stories <laughs> that I've heard, and in a, an extremely difficult setting. And it's, uh, and and I think maybe you've you've talked about this, but if you, if you wanted to address what the 
replication, replication possibilities would be of, of, of an experience in Afghanistan con, con, compared to the constraints that a lot of other countries are having this, doing this because it's, um, it is a way out for governments that are, um, who have limit, that have limited capacity and an enormous need if they can, if they can con contract with, with NGOs. The other question that I have is, is more clarification, and I'm, I'm looking again at this table and EC, PPAs, MOH, and USAID. It, my assumption is that um, these four donors, add, I, I, my question's about coverage, and do these four groups add up to 100% or nearly 100%? I know Sally said that the MSH project was reaching a third of the country, and I'm trying to figure out what part of the other two-thirds were, were covered by whom. It's, it, my, I mean, uh, we, we actually, I actually asked the GCMU folks to, to look at this, and so what they did was they found every district, they looked at every single district in Afghanistan and saw whether there was a, uh, there was uh, money that was dedicated for the delivery of the basic package of health services for each district. And when you add up the population of those districts, that's 90% of those that, that have. So, uh, yeah, much of it is, is covered, uh, at least uh, uh, now. And uh, in fact, r much of the remainder is urban and peri-urban areas. So, uh, so far, so good. I, I, I think that, that works. Your other question about um, what does this mean for, say, Central America and, and other non-conflict areas. Um, I actually think that, that uh, and, and this is partly based on, on personal experience in Pakistan and, and Bangladesh, um, that I think that this is, this is a model that can work in, in other settings. Uh, and again, the principles are, are fairly simple. You need to have clear geographical uh, responsibility. You need to have a base, a package of services. You need to have a clear set of indicators. If you have those few things, I think you have an opportunity to, to contract, and my sense is that it will work reasonably well. And the evidence that we have from other countries, uh, a colleague of mine and I uh, have an article in The Lancet about a year ago, which looked at about 10 different examples of this from around the world. And I think that they're, they're reasonably successful, and the more experience we have, um, I think the better it looks. Now, it is possible to screw up with contracting, and generally it's because People are not clear about the geographical areas. They're not clear about how they're going to measure performance or what the services are. And so lack of clarity uh, can really uh, you know, sort of uh, undermine uh, its success. But if you look after those basic things, I, I think it's an unfair fight. Uh, you know, to some extent, uh, an NGO doesn't have to put up with civil service rules and regulations. They don't have to put up with the political nonsense that, that uh, governments have to put up with. On average, they're better motivated, and they can and afford to hire good managers. And you don't have a seniority system which you know promotes the the, the dullest and and uh, least objectionable to positions of influence. So to me, it's I, I mean it ought to be true, and it looks like it is true. Um, I, I think that the evidence for it is good. It's not great. I mean, I, I think that that you know it's it's an evolving thing. But it's a lot better than a lot of other things that you know people people are promoting. So, I, just a further comment on that. I think there are two advantages we had in Afghanistan that may not be true in in other countries. One was starting from almost nothing. I mean, this is a country that had been in war for more than two decades, and what was left, not a whole lot. The second thing, to me, in my experience, that was so unique about Afghanistan was the government's willingness to completely hand over service delivery to the NGO community and recognizing that they had a stewardship role, they had policy, standards, systems roles, but they were willing to hand over to the NGOs. And I think where you're starting in a country that has all these things already in place and the government wants to do it all, it, it will be a lot more difficult to do this type of contracting. We're going to catch these final two questions and then give you guys a final word. Um, Nazo Qureshi, Child Survival and Health Grants Program at USAID. In further thinking through sort of um, international NGOs and local NGOs and potential partnerships at the country level, um, I was very interested in knowing um, the larger scale contracts, what sort of a target area population or beneficiary base um, are you suggesting? Because I have seen a 500,000 beneficiaries from your paper. 
So, and who were the NGOs who were performing well at this, or who would perform well at this level of a scale, or at this scale? Um, second question is, I was very interested in knowing the, the approaches of the three donors um, uh, for the behavioral component of the package of services, and to what extent did you, um, in your guidance, standardize and en or enable innovations, and ultimately, how does this feed into the um, capacity building of the government? Okay, and if you could hand the microphone over to the gentleman right there, then we'll, this final question. Oh, okay, I, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to follow on what Sally said. My question was going to be, I'm a Foreign Service Officer. I'm with USAID, the Bureau for Global Health. I've been overseas for a number of years and then back here in Washington. My experience overseas has been exactly the point that you made at the, at the very end of what you just said, which was going to be my question, is that in all the countries where I've worked, which haven't been conflict-prone countries, this is a hugely difficult problem getting governments and ministries of health to accept this kind of a model because it actually is true that there's a blob of money, it's this big, <laughs> and they'd rather have all the money go to them than to go to the NGOs. So having this experience, and, and, and again, you've, you've talked about Afghanistan. I've just had an experience evaluating the MSH program in Haiti, so I know something about Haiti. The other thing that was mentioned was Cambodia. Well, gee, guess what? You know, Afghanistan and Cambodia and Haiti have these kind of things in common that they're kind of basket cases. There isn't anything there in the beginning. What, are you, what do you do in a place where there is something there, like you just said? Do you have any ideas about how you approach governments, how you enter into that dialogue and get them to be sympathetic and willing to go along with this model because every place I've worked they're really not and, and they're actually really against it and it's a huge political problem. Um, okay, on the question of scale, uh, uh, I think um, the, uh, the PPAs, uh, the original uh, eight PPAs, they varied in scale from about 300,000 to a million. And these were done by uh, local NGOs, international NGOs, and I, I think it's about right. I think I think that's that's about the right right scale um, uh, to do it at. Now, um, uh, we actually looked at this, and the larger the the population, the lower the cost per per beneficiary. And uh, I won't bore you with the details, but there was an initial round of bidding where. It was broken up into sub uh, sub uh, provincial clusters of districts, and the cost per capita was uh, almost twice as high. The bid price was almost twice twice as high. So I think that the economic uh, uh, the financial economies of scale are real. I, I, it's not 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 trivial. Is there a difference between you know what kind of NGOs can take this on? You know there was a lot of skepticism at the beginning about the uh, capacity of NGOs to do this and. Oh, I, I, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to people about this. Yes, uh, you know, okay. Well, there's Ibn Sina and and there's Swedish Committee, but like, who else can do this? And it turned out that um, I, I think that that people tend to underestimate uh, uh, the capacity of NGOs and the capacity of people in these circumstances. And there's unfortunately no measure that you can do uh, uh, a priori that tells you who's going to perform well and who's going to perform badly. Um, I wish there was a Swedish committee in uh, Wardak at the first they were they were stinking out the joint it was awful uh, <laughs> it took it took a really difficult meeting between the Ministry of Health and the the country director of Swedish committee a letter to the board of directors in Stockholm kapow it was like they were transformed talk about responsive uh, so I, I think that it's not um, it's not easy to predict who's going to do well and who's going to do badly. Um, uh, and so uh, give, people, give people a chance. Uh, on, and then on the question about, about sort of, you know, this being a new model, yes, uh, it is easier to try this in post-conflict areas. There are greenfield sites in many ways. Um, however, um, uh, in the paper that I mentioned earlier, there, we have a few examples from non conflict, non-fragile uh, locations where this has worked. Uh, one was Bangladesh, where there was an urban primary health care project. Now, to be fair, the government did not have a lot of facilities in the urban areas of Bangladesh. So again, you had a sort of quasi-greenfield site. But my colleagues in the bank have worked in rural areas, where God knows the government does have a lot of uh, health facilities. 
uh, and has come up with a way of, of getting more of it contracted to, to NGOs. You are absolutely right that this is not easy. This goes against all the things that I mentioned. They have vested interests in keeping things the way they are. They take it as an implicit, actually almost explicit criticism of their ability to deliver services. And frankly speaking, it's true. You know, if things were going well through the government, we wouldn't be here talking about this. Um, uh, third, uh, they don't want to give up the power and prestige that comes with uh, managing these, uh, these health services. So I I'm not underestimating how difficult this will be. Uh, my sense though, and I was just in India at a state health systems workshop bringing together a whole bunch of, of mostly public officials from all over India. Two or three years ago I was working in Tamil Nadu in the south and, and the Tamils hated the idea of working with NGOs. They were doing it because they were being pushed by the, the, you know, the ugly World Bank to do this, but you could tell in it. They just, every, every dollar that wasn't going to them was like you know, theft. Um, they didn't like them, they didn't trust them. I saw a real sea change in, in the sort of behaviors. It was more a question of how are we going to do this rather than whether we're going to do this. Um, now, I think th this, is, this is the beginning of a process. And I, I, have, I completely agree with you. This is not easy. But you know, even in India, they have contracted pretty much all their ancillary services in hospitals now are done outside the civil service. So cleaning, you know, security, uh, food management, all that stuff. And it's being done much better for much lower cost. And it's slowly seeping in, well, geez, you know, maybe some of the other parts of the, the service delivery can be done. So I see even in India, the most status place I know, um, that there are real, there are real openings on this. So uh, we'll see. I think, I think this is an evolving story. Uh, but I agree with you, it's not, it's not going to be easy. Um, I agree with what Benjamin said. So I'll try to address, I, I want to make sure I understand. You asked about the behavioral component, meaning information and behavior change? Right, and usually, and how you dealt with sort of different strategies that the NGOs, BBOs may bring to the table. Some right. of them sometimes are branded. Was there an attempt to standardize these? And as you move forward, particularly in the next round of um, awards and contracts, are you trying to establish some sort of a framework within which these divergent um, strategies or innovations that make sense so that there is some coherence in the longer term for the, for the government. Yeah, I, I capacity I, building needs at that level, particularly in the behavioral area. Go, going forward, I'm not sure, but during the REACH project, we, uh, we did do some capacity building with the IEC unit within the ministry. It was very difficult. It was one of the weakest units that we worked with. Um, however, we did manage through that consensus process that I described to get agreement on standard messages about 12 different primary health care activities or initiatives. Um, those were approved by the ministry for use and reach and all of that um, basic material and we made all sorts of you know posters, flip charts for use in communities, for use in health facilities and, and so on and by health workers um, are available to all the other projects. We did not pay the price of producing them but the, the, the basic messages are there and they've been field tested in, in throughout the REACH program. So um, I don't know what's going to happen going forward. I'm sorry. I can't answer that. If I can just uh, chime in on this. I think there's an important principle here and that is when USAID and governments in the World Bank are interested in contracting with NGOs or, or working with uh, you know, other non-state providers, we should be careful about telling people how to do their business. We should say what, we should agree on your job is to increase CPR and you know sort of we, we're very interested that people have access to family planning and antenatal care and immunization etc so set those targets in terms of, of you know Im immunization coverage shall increase to 50 or 60 percent whatever it is um, you should be a little bit reluctant to tell people how to do their their job uh, you know it's bad enough in Kabul uh, but worse I mean the idea of people sitting in Washington and this side of you know Pennsylvania or the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue, trying to tell people in rural uh, Afghanistan you know how they should deliver services, I, I just don't think that's wise. And I think people will, and and I've seen this, they will figure out very interesting ways of doing this. So give them a chance. Uh, they will innovate. They will try different things, and um, uh, you know you, you'll be surprised at, at sort of the good things that that will will come out of that. So focus on the what rather than the how, and I think that's hard because everybody wants to control the how. And it, where there's good scientific evidence, okay, sure, uh, you know, where there's not, uh, you know, you should give people cut people uh, a fair bit of slack in this regard. 
what we have uh, we've gone over, but I think it's because of the richness of the presentations, as well as the quality of the questions. So, uh, thank you, folks, for for sticking with us, um, with the, for going over a bit. Won't you please join me in, in thanking our guests for really rich presentations. <laughs> And also just a reminder, the, the, the PowerPoints and maybe some of these other documents that Benjamin is talking about sending, we'll put on the website and encourage you all to, to access there and let us know if there's anything else we can track down that would be helpful in that, in that realm. Thanks. It's a pleasure. My, my pleasure. <laughs> okay. Um, you, I know. Um, uh, 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 of course. Yes. He's just gone to Cambodia. Do you know that? Yeah. I, I need to. I need to send him a.